Welcome to Mundy. My mama says bad words. Thanks for listening. See you next time. I, I did it. Good job. Finding the right jeans is hard. Accepting your jeans is even harder. Whether you wear boyfriend or boot cut, high rise or low rise, this podcast will teach you to love the jeans you're in. I'm Rachel. And I'm Tina. And we're going to use modern research to bust diet myths and get real about body after baby. We're going to take you on a journey of unpacking your old beliefs about food and weight so you can learn to nourish your body and raise body confident kids. So put your booty in a chair and let's talk mom jeans. Welcome to season four of Mom Jeans. This season is called the Bite Size Education Series, where we give you quick bits of science and psychoeducation to help you in your journey towards body respect. This season, we will be answering your listener questions and interviewing amazing experts to expand your knowledge. So get ready for easily digestible, mm, pun intended, pieces of education in podcast form. Alrighty, welcome to this week's episode of Mom Jeans. We are in our bite sized education series. And today we are going to be talking about hunger and what am I hungry for? So we got a great listener question that Rachel can read, and then we're going to dive in to this topic. All right, we got a great listener question we wanted to chat about. And the listener question is Dear Mom Jeans, I am learning so much about how to listen to my body signals to finally break the diet cycle. Yay! Yay! I'm more in touch with my hunger cues, learning to understand when I feel full, and even aware when I'm wanting a snack, when I'm feeling bored or sad instead of hungry. But I still have times when I get a little confused if what I'm feeling is physical hunger if I'm just in the mood for a certain food, or if it's emotional eating. Can you give more details on the types of hunger so I can keep learning to differentiate? Love, hungry parent. When I hear this question, yeah, I'm like, this is amazing because honestly, all three options are fabulous options, right? Like I hear, like, am I eating based off of physical hunger? Am I just in the mood for something? Or am I emotionally eating? And so I think... Um, we're going to dive into the, how I explain to clients, which is the three quote unquote types of hunger. Um, and this is just something that I've kind of made up over time in a way to explain to clients, but the listener question, guess what? All three are appropriate. And so it's, it's not as black and white. It's not straightforward intuitive eating and learning how to engage in your body attunement is, is complex. And so hopefully in this episode, we can provide a little bit more education, but I I feel like people might be leaving with more questions than maybe answers. And that's okay, because that just might mean that you need to explore more with a particular individual, like a professional dietitian or therapist to really break down some of those signals that you're um, confused about. All right, so three types of hunger we're going to chat about today are physical, emotional, and logical. So we're going to go into each of those, but those are your three that we're always going to be circling back to just so you can make a little mental bookmark. Yep. So I'm going to tap into how I explain this to clients, and then Rachel is going to chime in on the emotional therapeutic. I don't want to say emotional because we're going to be using that word a lot, but she's going to be chiming in on the therapeutic component because this is really intertwined. Okay. So all three types of hunger can be and are affected by our uh, therapeutic state, emotional state. So the way I explain it, we have three types of hunger, logical, emotional, physical. 
logical is going to be that hunger that's up in our brain. It's, it's logical. So this can be timing of eating. It could be um, where to eat, what to eat, nutrition information. It really is very tangible, logical information. So if you're working with maybe a dietitian or you already have this skill really built firmly in your framework, it is when I wake up, I like to eat breakfast and I typically eat breakfast within an hour of being awake. And when I eat breakfast, I know that for my body, I like to eat macro balance. So having some carbs, some protein and some fat. For me personally, I like to make sure that I have a substantial amount of protein And if I have something that is carb heavy, let's say maybe like an oatmeal that I just know logically that my body is going to send a pretty quick communication that it's hungry again soon after. So this is just some logical framework that I've learned over time. After I have breakfast, I typically get hungry between two to three hours But logically, I know that my body needs fuel within that time frame. And so I'm going to have a snack available. Then from there, another two to three hours, or it could be one to three, one to four. It really depends on your individualized needs. I'm going to have another meal. And then from there, another framework, two to three hours, a snack, check in with my body. Then from dinner, there from dinner, two to three hours. You see where I'm going from here. So the logical idea is kind of based off of timing. It's also based off of nutrition knowledge, right? Another example of logical hunger is that, um, let's say I'm, I kind of have privilege here because as a dietitian, I can eat in sessions. And so pretty much whenever I'm hungry, I can eat with clients, with professionals. It's, is pretty accessible. But let's say you're in a situation where you can't eat and you're going into a meeting or a work event or whatever the situation may be. Logically, you may check in with yourself and go, well, I'm not physically hungry right now, but logically it's 11 a.m. I know I typically get hungry around noon, but I'm going to be in a meeting and I can't eat at that point. So to fuel my body, I'm going to eat now as a preemptive way to fuel my body, knowing that I don't want to be in the meeting at noon and be hungry and distracted because the meeting's two hours long and I don't want to be hungry for that long. So logically, I'm going to protect my body and give it the care that it needs. So that's another angle of logical hunger. Yeah, two examples I give for logical hunger are also scheduling examples. And I just took a road trip with my kids. And I'm not sure if any of you parents have ever gone on a road trip with your kids. But when you stop at the rest stop, everyone has to go pee. Whether or not you have to go, just go, try, pee what you can. Because we've got two more hours to the next stop, right? My kids are like, I don't really have to go. And I'm like, I don't care. Just try and then we get back in the car now that is not letting them some in- urine out of your body okay right now we are not supporting clearly <laughs> intuitive peeing in that example um hopefully they won't need therapy for that someday however that's kind of sometimes an example of this concept of logical hunger it's like you know that two hours later you're going to be really, really hungry and you're not going to be able to stop for that food or that snack. It might make sense to kind of fuel your body and give your body some of the energy it needs, knowing that it's going to be really, really miserable emotionally and physically to be starving. So that is a little example of kind of a fun example of how to do logical hunger. Now, obviously, trying to eat when you're hungry and stop when you're full is, you know, the ideal, but let's let's face it, we don't always live in the most ideal, perfectly scheduled environment. So that could be an example of one way you actually do take care of yourself is figuring out exactly where and when to plan your snacks based on your schedule. Yeah, great example. I love how you bring up intuitive peeing. I'm going to bring that in when we talk about physical hunger. So side note. Okay. So the one, the other thing I want to add to this is. As humans, ideally, we're all experiencing all three types of hunger at the same time. But there also might be times where one type of hunger needs to 
take over and be a higher priority. And typically with my clients, I recommend logical hunger come into play in that scenario. And so if you can think of logical hunger as the framework and the foundation to your recovery, your self-care, your nutritional understanding, your body attunement, whatever it is, logical hunger is always going to be the thing that you can really come back to. So this is the foundation to fueling your body. So if the other two types of hunger are quieter, then we need to make sure that we can tune into that logical sense. One other piece about logical hunger I often hear in my therapy settings is that people have a lot of trauma from a feeling of hunger if they've been dieting or had a restrictive eating disorder. So that sense of being really hungry and feeling deprived brings up a lot of anxiety and a lot of fear for them. So logical hunger is a huge piece of their recovery and their healing because they want to make sure they always have a little something in them or they feel like they're they have enough fuel so that they don't have that extreme hunger or even just feeling really, really deprived because that brings back so many awful memories or brings back a diet mentality in them. So logical hunger can also be very healing in that capacity. So that brings us to emotional hunger. I feel like emotional hunger gets the worst rap in our society. So sad. I know. So sad. Because let's face it, food is fuel, but also our tongues, eh, I'm sticking out my tongue, have taste buds. Turns out that we are created to enjoy the taste of our food and therefore enjoying our food, finding satisfaction and getting an emotional element from what we eat is just biology. So emotional hunger is not negative. In fact, if you look at all of your favorite family memories, perhaps, or some celebrations that you love or holidays, usually there is food that is correlated. We usually use food to connect around a table. We usually use food and drink to celebrate and honor different holidays or people. So food is something that is a beautiful gift and the emotional element of it is something that we should not shy away from. The other thing that I love to help people figure out is how they're using food to cope with their feelings. So we are given five senses. One of them is taste. The senses help us regulate our nervous systems and our five senses help us also process stimulation in our environment and also help us process information and help us regulate our emotions. So because one of our senses is taste, it is normal for us to use taste and use eating to calm or to regulate our nervous systems when we're anxious or depressed. The other flip side of that is sometimes when we're anxious and depressed, we struggle with being connected to the physical hunger, which we'll go into soon. And so that is one thing to always be mindful of. When our emotions are really high, what is our relationship with food? Are we avoiding it? Are we ignoring the physical pieces? Or are we using food to regulate? Now, again, some of that is very, very normal. Some of it can potentially be problematic, and we'll go into that in a minute. But I just want people to realize that because this is a biological component, it's very nuanced, and it's something to always be considering and looking at. What are the coping skills you need to use to regulate your body, your emotions, your nervous system? Is food something that would be a good fit for that right now or something else be a good fit for that? Yeah. And so I'll jump into how I explain this to clients and then we'll kind of touch on some of the points that Rachel brought up that need kind of further exploration. So when I bring this up with clients, I call it emotional hunger, or if someone's kind of triggered by that word, I bring up heart hunger or cravings. And so it is very normal to want to eat something because it sounds good or want to continue to eat because it tastes really good. And despite feeling physically full or logically knowing that you have met your quote unquote portion needs, I'm going to take some more bites because my taste buds, my craving is wanting to have more of this taste. That is all very normal. I think it's really important to recognize that, again, we're experiencing all three types of these hungers. And so are you finding that your emotional hunger, your heart hunger, your cravings, 
um, eating food for coping with emotions, that that is taking over the other two and that this is the primary one. And so when we think about, yeah, I emotionally ate today, which is I had a dessert or ate beyond my physical fullness because I was directly coping with an emotion. I recognized it. I made that choice and I feel good for doing it. An example could be I ate cookies just because they were there and they tasted good and I wanted to. Great. So you were eating for pleasure. That's an emotion. That's totally okay. However, are you doing it all the time? Are you doing it as your main coping skill? If we think about coping skills, you ultimately have a toolbox of coping skills, which includes many, many, many different types of coping skills in different scenarios. Some will work, some won't. Others, you know, it's, there's a variety of what's going to work in that moment or really what's just going to create space for emotional toleration. Now, if you're finding that you're turning to food as a form of emotional coping, as a form of dissociation, as a form of numbing, and that is the main coping skill and you're not utilizing any other ones, then this would require some further exploration. It's, it's not that we can't utilize food as a coping skill, but it's that I don't want you to utilize food as the only coping skill. Similarly, I don't want you only utilizing talking to friends or support from other people as your main coping skill. We want to make sure that there's a variety there. I agree. I think it is very easy to turn to food as the primary coping skill because it's usually pretty accessible. And so it is easy to just kind of think at the end of the day, I'm really overwhelmed and I'm really tired and I have so many problems to solve and I don't know how to solve them, but there's a numbing out that I can get if I am eating or if food is something that is distracting me. So I think it's something to always be considering. Am I using this coping skill to actually process, to cope, to kind of maybe distract temporarily, or am I constantly using it to avoid problem solving and to avoid something bigger that I really need to be facing? Just like we wouldn't want you to sit down every single night and just crochet for hours and hours and avoid paying your bills, right? We don't want you sitting down and eating for hours and hours and avoid paying your bills. So we can neutralize it as a coping skill that we can have in the toolbox, but something that we also want to use in moderation. So show your blanket, have a snack, call your friends, do all of the different things. Right. I think the negative angle around this is that emotional eating is deemed as something negative or, you know, people utilize this word binge and see it as a negative, right? I'm binging on food or I'm overeating or I'm eating too much or I'm emotionally eating. And I think we can really support our connection to our bodies and tuning into this hunger by leaning into it, right? Like, what is actually going on to where your body needs this emotional skill, this emotional connection to food? And so a lot of people try to avoid it. Like I'm really trying to stop emotional eating. I'm really trying to stop quote unquote binging, which, you know, a lot of times is based off of the emotional component. And so with that, I really try to explore. So if you feel like this is a hunger signal that is higher up on the totem pole and you're not utilizing the, any of the other types of hunger, I would encourage you to lean in, explore. Why is it happening? What's going on? What are you missing in your life? What are you trying to dissociate from? Why is this being present? Is it really that you're not physically honoring your needs. So it's coming out as a biological response to eat, right? So a lot of people say like, I'm emotionally eating. I don't actually think you're emotionally eating. I think you're biologically being driven to eat food that are denser in carbohydrates, like desserts and sweets and things along those lines, because you're actually not honoring the other types of hunger signals. And so 
people tend to ignore the emotional eating response because they see it as a negative. So again, this can really be such an important sign that your body's not getting enough nutrition and that biologically your body is overriding all other signals to get your needs met. So that's, that's another kind of last angle here. Well, I think what you're kind of saying is that deprivation mentality and a diet culture and all the healthism of healthy foods and non-healthy foods can really impact emotional eating. So that's why physical is obviously something we'll go into next. Because if the physical is not met, the emotional can easily be triggered. 100%. So what a beautiful segue into physical hunger. Thanks, right. we've been doing this for seasons and learning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so physical hunger, ooh. Okay, it is challenging. I am going to create an analogy before we actually dive into the physical hunger. Okay, I want everyone to pretend that we're sitting at an old radio, okay? It's it's sad that like some kids aren't going to know what a, a radio, you know, like a actual radio is because they have like jam boxes and really just speakers now that they like send f- music from their phone to a big speaker. Anyways, this is called a radio. It's where we transmit. I also don't know what a jam box is, but okay. It's maybe a big I'm speaker. <laughs> it's a big speaker. Anyway, I'm on the opposite end. I know the radio jam box. Oh gosh. Okay. I'm Go right ahead, in the analogy. middle, even though we're the same age. It's okay, Rachel. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so, all right. A radio is a thing that <laughs> transmits sound and music and news that has knobs. Okay. So pretend we're sitting there, your body, all three types of these hungers are going to have a volume knob. Okay. And each volume knob for the logical, the emotional, the physical can be turned at different angles. So zero is volume down. 10 is volume very loud. Five is volume right where we like it. Okay. So you may notice that certain things affects your volume knobs. With a physical, the reason why I bring that up is because the physical volume knob is a real sensitive knob. If you bump it slightly, it can be triggered and be affected for the volume. So instances like high emotions, for some people that can turn the volume up all the way on the physical knob and it can feel like you're physically hungry all the time because your emotions are high or if you're emotionally um, high emotions and you're one of those individuals where your high emotions turns the volume down you may not feel any sort of physical hunger because the emotions are heightened However, what I tell people is that just because the volume knob is turned down or up doesn't mean that the signal isn't regulating, but this is why we need to tap into the logical hunger to use as the foundation where it's like, wow, I really recognize that typically I get hungry around these times or this portion, this amount of food typically is satisfying. If it's not, can I check in with my body? Can I check in with all three types of hunger and see what's going on? Right. And so that may be, I'm checking in with my emotional state. I'm checking in. When's the last time I ate? Wow. I haven't eaten in five hours. No wonder my volume knob feels like it's cranked up all the way. And my signals are extremely loud physically. Another one that manipulates volume knobs are medication. And so if you're an individual that's on a stimulant or maybe a lot of medication, your volume knob could be turned way down. And so you may not really feel physical hunger signals, but that doesn't mean that your metabolism, your body's energy needs aren't needing food, that those have metabolically changed. It's just that the volume knob is turned down. So hopefully this is somewhat of a helpful analogy to recognize that just because the knobs are kind of tweaked in your recovery process or in your body attunement process, 
doesn't mean that they're off. It's just meaning that you might need to work with a professional or someone to really help you regulate the awareness around those volume knobs, what affects your connection to your body and what your energy needs really are and coping skills are. I think the biggest helper when I am going over this with clients is to understand the very nuanced signals in our bodies that signal hunger. So I think often people wait until they're starving their stomach's rumbling, they feel faint, they are constantly like just ready to devour a plate, right? Which, okay, sometimes that happens if we have not done our logical hunger, circling back to our first point. But there's little ways that it's easy to start realizing when that knob is starting to turn. So for some people, they start salivating a little bit more. Some people just start thinking about food. As you're driving down the street, all of a sudden you're like, huh, that kind of looks good. Or, ooh, I'm kind of in the mood for that type of food. And all of a sudden you're starting to think about that food. That could be a little signal that your knob is turning. You could start feeling a little bit more lightheaded or a little more brain fog, and that could be a signal that your fuel level is decreasing. So I think finding the small little signals can really, really help people start to understand where, when, how much, what to eat, and how to keep fueling themselves so they can combine the logical pieces. They could be honoring the physical and also always be checking in with the emotional components as well. Okay. You mentioned such a good point, which is that a lot of people wait too long, or I hear a lot of times people creating really arbitrary reasons that they need to meet in order to allow themselves to eat food. Okay, so I'm going to come back to intuitive peeing. Okay, (laughs) come in full circle. circle here. Okay. Let's say you are in your office or on a road trip. No, we won't use a road trip. Let's say you're in your office. You have full access to a bathroom, okay? You feel the signal of pee. What do you do? I have to pee, okay? You don't start doubting it like, hmm, maybe that's a headache. Mm. Maybe, (laughs) Maybe I'm hungry. Maybe my back itches. Maybe I'm bored. Maybe it's just emotional. Maybe I just feel like going to the restroom for no reason. Exactly. Or you start setting requirements. I'm going to wait 10 minutes and then I'll pee. Or I'm going to wait until my pee is so unbearable uh, and then I'm almost peeing my pants in order to allow myself Mm -hmm. to go. Or I should have really exercised today before I go pee. So unfortunately, I'm not going. I don't deserve. I don't deserve to pee. pee. I'm not going to pee because I didn't go to the gym today. Right. I know this kind of sounds silly, but this is what people do with the hunger signal. Right. So hopefully when you have the urge to pee, you go pee. And when you go pee, you just trust your body that somehow your bladder is literally going to empty all of its pee. You don't sit in the toilet and go, I'm only allowed to pee out four ounces. And then you start peeing and then you stop, (laughs) you hold it and you leave like that. Your body's response would be developing a UTI or an infection, right? So, but this is what people do with the physical hunger of their body. They create these really arbitrary reasonings for why their body is feeling this hunger, how much they should really eat, not trusting in their body. So this is intuitive peeing. Hopefully you can use this analogy to help you give a little bit more permission to your physical hunger. The other angle is physical hunger is gentle. It is not intense. Now we may find points that we get to where it's like, darn it, I didn't utilize my logical hunger as well. I got caught in a scenario where I didn't pack some snacks. I was in a meeting. I didn't prep. And now I'm ravenous. Okay. Guess what? Learning experience. You recognize that your body is coming into this meal or snack, very hungry, 
physically, logically, emotionally, all of the above, and that you might need to utilize some skills to make sure that you're, you know, taking some space to listen to your body, but also that your body just might need more food in this moment because it's really, really hungry. Okay. So physical sensation is gentle. Give yourself permission to eat when you feel it. I tell people like pretend there's a little gnome inside your body. Okay. And the gnome at a gentle physical hunger is just going. Hopefully that comes through. It's just a gentle blow. Okay. I'm blowing picture. Help me out. I'm a gnome inside your stomach going. Okay. I'm not a gnome inside going yang, 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 with these claws, like ripping out your insides. Okay. That gnome is angry and starving and literally going to eat you. Okay. We want a very gentle gnome that's either blowing or doing kind of horse lips in a sense. The horse lips, it's a little bit more intense where it's like, okay, that's, that's a little bit more intense of a hunger. But if you're exiting beyond the horse lips, okay, and into a ravenous vulture of a gnome, you're too hungry. You're setting yourself up to really struggle. So ultimately giving yourself permission to have just that gentle gnome that's blowing on the inside of your stomach. That's the best way. I don't know. In all my years of doing this, I'm like, that is honestly the best way that I can describe gentle hunger. Do you have another way? Uh, nope, but I'm pretty sure <laughs> now I'm picturing a gnome inside my stomach, and so are all of our listeners. So yeah. whatever works. Okay, that's new <laughs> to me as well. All right, we are going to end and wrap up this episode with two points. One, on that said road trip and the restroom stop, we are in a line for the toilets and a wise old woman got in line behind me and I said oh sorry we'll go fast and she goes oh dear don't worry I learned a long time ago not to wait till the last minute and if that is not the wisest little advice (laughs) for eating and peeing (laughs) and that I've ever heard so we are going to end with that advice as well as the advice that this entire concept to go back to our hungry parent who wrote in is a very curious, non-judgmental attitude. So making sure that you are just aware, you're mindful, you're curious, and you're honoring your body without judgment and let it guide you as you figure out what to eat, when to eat, how much to eat, and to explore all these different types of hunger. Thanks for listening and we will see you next week. Bye. That's a wrap on this episode of the Bite Size Education Series, and we hope this new information provides you with a more critical lens when you hear mainstream diet culture messaging. You can connect with us on social media, on Instagram, at MomJeansThePodcast, and feel free to email your own listener questions to MomJeansThePodcast at gmail.com. If you loved the episode, please leave us a rating and review on iTunes and recommend the episode to a friend. Sending you the inner strength to accept your jeans with a G and wear the jeans with a J. Bye. This episode of Mom Jeans was produced and edited by Rachel Coleman and Tina LaBoy. Just a reminder, this episode is not a substitute for therapeutic counsel or nutrition advice. Thank you to Jerry DePizzo for the music production. You can find episode information and show notes at www.momjeansthepodcast.com. Follow us on Instagram at momjeansthepodcast and join the Mom Jeans the Podcast Facebook group to find a community of mamas learning to love their bodies and discussing the episodes. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Mom Jeans. See you next time.